Uh, well, good morning, everybody. If, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and uh, flip open to Matt, Mark uh, chapter 14. And uh, we're going to be in verses 3 through 11 uh, today. And so continuing our series, Miracles in Mark. And today is going to be a little bit uh, of a different miracle. It's not so much where we see Jesus uh, do some awesome healing that we're amazed at. Uh, but rather, we're going to see a story of a woman, Mary of Bethany, who comes before Jesus. She breaks a very expensive jar of perfume that was worth more than a year's wages. She pours it before Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, uh, as surely as you know, my gospel is preached throughout all the world, this story of this woman will be told as well. And the miracle is that 2,000 years later, we're still talking about what this woman did. And, I, and I'd want us to look at this scripture in a little different way than maybe you've done before. For myself, I came across a little bit of this a few months ago, but then as I was studying this week, it just came back uh, to light in me. And uh, here's what I want to look at today, the title of the message, Sold Out or Sell Out. Sold Out or Sell Out. And, and listen to these definitions, sold out. Completely committed, devoted, invested, and engaged to a cause. Sell out. One who betrays a cause for personal advancement. Let me read it again, sold out completely committed devoted invested and engaged to a cause and sell out one who betrays a cause for personal advancement i'm going to show you a video here in just a second but i did something a few weeks ago uh, that i don't normally do and i don't do a lot and i'm not good at i, I went to the skating rink right and uh listen when you're this tall you shouldn't be on skates ice skates roller skates roller blades don't matter what it is stay off of them right I, I tell people I'm like Bambi out there right you know just falling everywhere on the ice and and, and roller skates and and so I, I go roller skating uh but you know if I'm doing something I'm all in and so out there well, as I'm roller skating I decide you know I'm going to be sold out I'm going to dance I'm going to skate I'm going to give it everything that I got and so I'm going to show you a quick video uh of me skating look at those moves and then look at that, that's like a gazelle. I mean, just, just floating down the ring. Wait for it. Boom. Now, I want to point a few things out to you here. I was sold out. I mean, you saw me. I was breaking it down. I was skating. I was going for it. I was sold out. And when I, hail, when I, when I hit the ground, when I fell, you know, my wife didn't come over and say, hey, hey, darling, are you okay, sweet one? Like, would you like some ice? That video that you just saw, she was the one capturing it, right? So while I'm sold out, she's selling me out, right? When I come back, it's already all over the internet, man down. I'm like, thanks, babe. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I, th thanks, for, thanks for caring for me in this moment, right? So I was sold out. She was selling me out. And in this story today, we're going to see one woman who was sold out for Jesus, and we're going to see another man who was selling Jesus out. We're going to see a woman, Mary of Bethany, who was sold out for Jesus, and we're going to look at a character that, that many of us know his name, and if we don't know much about him, we've heard it used from time to time, but a guy named Judas who was selling Jesus out. And let's read Mark chapter 14, 3 through 11, and, and before I do, you know, we all sell Jesus out to some extent or another, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we all have, have you know, sell Jesus out at one point or another, but here's my point, is, is in the grand scheme of your life, are you sold out for Jesus? Would people say that you were sold out for Jesus? You know, when we look at King David's life, we don't look at his life without mistakes. We don't look at it without sin in his life. He committed adultery. He had her husband killed. But we also look at him and say, man, that was a man who was sold out for God, a man after God's own heart. And so in the grand scheme of your lives, if people were to look at it, would they say, man, they were sold out for Jesus or not so much? You know, they talked about Jesus, but they really didn't leave it out, and they really were just kind of selling Jesus out. Let's read. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you always have with you and you can help them at any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could she poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Now listen to verse 10 and 11. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. 
They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So you have this moment where Jesus is in the house. He's reclining at the table. This woman comes in, very expensive jar of perfume, more than a year's worth of wages, and she just breaks it and pours it out over Jesus. In that moment, you can tell uh, she's all about Jesus. She's devoted to Jesus. She just wants to get in the presence of Jesus and pour this perfume out over Jesus. And then that causes a scene. All of a sudden, these guys begin to murmur. They begin to get all riled up. You know, why are you doing that? We could have sold this and given it to the poor. And then Jesus replies, as we just read, he says, hey, um, you know, you, you always have the poor. You won't always have me. And what Jesus is not saying, he's not saying don't care for the poor. He's not saying don't care for the needy. But what he's really trying to say is, hey, these, this woman's intentions were good. Her heart is in the right place. She's doing a good thing in this moment. And she sold out for Jesus in that moment. And then in the same passage, you have a man named Judas who goes off and he gets a deal with the chief priests and elders to sell Jesus out. Sold out for Jesus or selling Jesus out. What I want to do is look at four ways. And, and what, as we walk through this passage, I want to look at Mary of Bethany, and I want to look at Judas, and I want to look at four different things and kind of compare and contrast them. And number one this morning, if you're taking notes, is this woman, when I look at her life, when I read this story, uh, man, she was fully devoted in this moment. I mean, she, she didn't care what anybody thought. She didn't care what anyone had to say. She was just devoted to getting in front of Jesus and pouring that perfume out. Now, I want you to know something as we read through uh, this scripture this morning. Um, we have in, uh, in Matthew and in uh, the book of uh, John this story, two more accounts of this story. The book of Luke is oftentimes debated. You have a sinful woman who anoints Jesus. It's very similar to this, but it's debated. Uh, some say that that was in uh, Galilee and this is in Bethany, and so two different stories. Also later in the Gospel of Luke, you have where it starts the exact same way and then Luke leaves the story out. So that's open for debate, but these, uh, Matthew and John, you have those two Gospels who share as well. And so as we flip through this story, I'm going to point out some different things from the story from some different Gospels. And you say, well, you know, are, are the stories different? Why do they not have it all together? Well, think of it this way. You've got different vantage points from different people on the same event that happened. Think of it this way. So, so if, if I were to tell you a story about something that happened and my wife were to tell you a story about something that happened and it was the exact same event that happened, we're going to have a little bit of a difference in our stories. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you the less details possible and just tell you what happened. My wife's probably going to give you X, Y, Z, W, Q, Y, Z, every, every detail that you can get in that story, tell you exactly how it happened and how it went about and fill you in greatly, right? And so when we compare these gospels, sometimes we get more details from some other guys than we get from some other guys, but we can piece it all together and see the same story. And so as we read through this today, I just want to go ahead and make you aware, and I'll try to point it out when I do it. Sometimes I'm going to pull from the story in John and then go back to Mark, and we're going to look at this story as a whole. So like I said, she was fully devoted. I mean, nothing else mattered in that moment for her except for Jesus. And devotion, oftentimes, we think about it, uh, you know, it's fueled by love. It's fueled by our love for someone or something. And so we're devoted to it because of love. And what I want us to think about real quickly this morning is that when we look at Judas's life, was he truly devoted to Jesus all the way through? Like, like, here's what I want us to think about. Like, you know, we hear about him betraying Jesus in that moment, but were there some things going on before we ever got to the mo that moment that actually led to that moment? Here's where I say you have to look at some of the other gospels. Look at John chapter 12. And listen to verse 4 and 5. Same story. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was going to betray him, asked, now before I read this, remember I said, there's some people stirring this up. Why did she pour this perfume out? We could have sold it. We could have given it to the poor. But what we find in the Gospel of John is there's really one person kind of stirring this up. There's one person making it a big deal about that. And isn't that often how it works? Usually it's not everybody causing a big fuss. It's one or two people, and then everybody else starts to get in with them and the person that we find who's causing this scene who's causing a big deal about her pouring this perfume out is Judas verse 5 this is Judas saying this why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor but because he was a thief 
and as keeper of the money bag, he used to take from what was put into it. Now, wait a second. Judas betrayed Jesus and sent him to the cross on Calvary. But I want to show you something. His betrayal and his devotion started long before. He was taking from the money bag. And so over time, Judas is betraying Jesus by taking from the money bag, taking from the money bag, taking from the money bag, betraying, 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 until ultimately the big decision to betray Jesus, to send him to the cross for 30 pieces of silver, wasn't that big for him because it led him down that path. It usually starts little. Let me betray Jesus here and take some money for myself. Let me betray him here and hold on to this for me. Let me betray him here and hold on to it for this. And so when I get to that big moment, I'm just doing what I've always done because I never dealt with it. You you know, think about this in life. It often starts little. Like I don't think someone wakes up and says, hey, I wanna be an alcoholic when I grow up. But drink after drink and, and then emotion and all kinds of things, stress and anxiety come and then one day you wake up and you're an alcoholic. Like, I don't think someone says, wakes up and says, hey, I want to ruin my family, I want to commit adultery, but one look, one text message, one time too long with someone, and then all of a sudden you wake up and you're over here. I I don't think someone wakes up and says, hey, I want to gamble all my money away, but time after time as they gamble and gamble and gamble and gamble, then all of a sudden you wake up broke on the other side. It starts small, but it leads to death and destruction. Don't you remember the book of James? It leads ultimately to death. But decision, 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 decision after decision. But think about this. What's so bad about this decision of betrayal of the money? What do we say? Devotion is fueled by love. So time and time again, what is Judas saying in these moments? As he's betraying Jesus, he's saying, I love money more than Jesus. I love what I can get from this money more than Jesus. I love what I can gain from this more than Jesus. Till ultimately, I love 30 pieces of silver more than Jesus now let me ask you this we can give Judas a hard time but if we were to follow the money trail the paper trail all the way back down and we were to say hey let's track your devotion by what you love by what you're chasing after by what you're choosing by what you're going after would it ultimately lead us to Jesus on the other side or would it lead us to something different What we love time and time again, we're choosing. And it will either lead you to a life that is sold out for Jesus on the other side or a life that just sailed Jesus out and you had the right words and you sang the right songs and you had the right answers, but in the end, you chose something else every other time. And you love something more every single time. You know, when we think about this sometimes, I don't know where you're at, but if we're human, I think sometimes we think, man, how could Jesus ask us to be fully devoted to him? Like, how could he ask us to give all of ourselves to him, to lay down every desire for him, to give up everything for him? Like, isn't that a little bit of a lot? Like, couldn't he just ask, like, 50%, maybe 60%? What about just Sunday and Wednesday? Two days out of the week, woo, we're good, baby. But 100%, every desire, every thought, everything given to the Lord, everything surrendered to him? But if you think about it, he's not asking you anything that he wasn't willing to do. I mean, think back to his devotion for us. When Judas came up and kissed him to betray him, and he let the soldiers take him away, they didn't take him away. Like, let's be real. In that moment, if my guy who'd been with me the whole time betrayed me in that moment, and I'm the son of God, I'm striking him down, and I'm striking those soldiers down, and I'm saying, see you later. But Jesus said, I'm devoted. Think of his devotion for us when he stood before trial and they mocked him and they ridiculed him and they beat him. Think of his devotion for us when they put a crown of thorns on his head and they put a purple robe around him. Think of his devotion for us when he carried the cross of Calvary and he couldn't even carry it the whole way there. Someone else had to carry it there. Think of his devotion as the nails pierced his hands and they pierced his feet. Think of his devotion as he hung naked and ashamed and died the death that a criminal should die, not the king of the world. Until he cried out, it is finished. He's not asking you to do anything that he didn't do for you. Why was he devoted to us? Love. He loved us, even when we didn't deserve it. You know, there's an old hymn 
And don't worry, I'm not going to sing it because I can't sing a lick. But I'm going to read you some of the lyrics, and many of you know it. And some of the words and some of the old songs are just so rich that I just want to read it out. But I surrender all. Just listen to it. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. He gave everything for you and I. His devotion, his love for us. And he's asking us to surrender everything and be devoted, fully devoted to him with everything that we have. Number two, that I want to give you when we look at this story and we look at Mary of Bethany and, and Judas is in fully invested, fully invested. You know, when you think about investments, you're thinking about investing in something for a greater profit or a greater return on the other end. And, and I love about this woman. She just says, I'm taking my investment straight to the bank and his name is Jesus. And I'm pouring it out over him. Like, I'm making my investment here and I'm pouring it out over Jesus. And so often when we think about it, what I think is interesting about this story is everybody's so concerned with the value of the perfume. Oh my goodness. How could you pour that perfume out? It's more than a year's worth of wages. Like they're just talking about the value of the perfume and worried about the perfume. And what's so great is I think Mary Bethany says, I don't care about the value of the perfume because I see the value of my Savior in front of me. And if it was five times worth a year's wages, I'm pouring it out and breaking it. If it was 10 years worth a year's wages, I'm breaking it and pouring it out. If it was 100 years worth of wages, I'm still breaking it and pouring it out. And it's still not enough to pour before and over my Savior. Like I think she's looking at it and saying, I don't see the value of this. I see the value of my Lord in front of me. Now think about this. This is where it gets tough for us. And this is where everybody wants to walk on eggshells. But when it comes to our life, could it be that it's so hard to give things to Jesus because we value it so much more than the one we should be valuing who could do something with it? Like we, 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 we have such a hard time letting go of those Benjamins and giving them to the Lord because we value those so much instead of valuing the Lord, valuing someone except eternity, valuing someone who's an orphan getting fed somewhere, valuing something about the kingdom of God that's eternal that'll go on forever and giving to it. And you know, when it comes to money, everybody gets uncomfortable. But Jesus talked about money a lot, a whole lot. Just look it up, read it. He talked about it time and time again. And could it be that so often in our lives, we're valuing our possessions so much instead of valuing the one who gave it to us in the first place, and that's why we have such a hard time letting go of it. Listen to this real quickly. You know, when it comes to, to tithing and giving to the Lord, let's just talk about this just for a little bit. Uh, but when it comes to tithing, there's different debates about it and all kinds of different things. But let me just say this. If it, was, if it was give 10% in the old covenant, how much more should we give in the new covenant when Jesus died for us? I mean, and at the end of the day, 10%, it probably should be a lot more. And, and let me just show you different things from Scripture uh, to look at this. Um, the thing of Acts 2.44 all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give it to anyone as he had need. Listen to Acts 4, 32. It's the early church. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. They just sold property. They sold land. They sold houses and brought it forward. Listen to this. Only 5% of Americans tithe and 80% of Americans only give 2% of their income. Listen to this. Christians are giving at 2.5% of income and during the Great Depression, it was 3.3%. For families making 75,000 and plus, 1% of them gave at least 10% in tithing. 
You know, when it comes to us giving our possessions, sometimes I think we're holding on because we value it so much more than the Lord. And we've got a tight grip. And maybe God's saying to some of us, hey, break that jar and pour it out. And can I just tell you, I just believe, maybe I'm old school, whatever, but the Lord's going to bless you. He's going to bless you. And he's going to take care of you. And what better thing to give to than the kingdom of God? Listen to this from John Piper. I'm just going to read them quick. I'm not going to go into them. And then I got a few more things for us on this. But seven biblical reasons to tithe. You can look this up as John Piper. It's honoring an Old Testament principle. It's honoring the creator as owner of all. It's the antidote to covetousness. It's governing ever-expanding spending. It's God's way of bringing about good deeds. It's God's way of providing for you. And it's proving and strengthening our faith. You know, I think about the story of the rich young ruler in the Gospel of Matthew. When he comes to Jesus, and Jesus already knows what's going on. He knows everything. And he tells the rich young ruler, hey, sell everything you have and then come follow me. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying today you've got to go sell your house and sell your boat and all that kind of stuff. If you do, great, you know, turn it in. And, uh, but I'm not, I'm not telling you you've got to do that. I'm just giving you an example. Jesus knows the root of the problem here for this guy is he loves his possessions. He loves his status. He loves his money more than he loves Jesus. And so Jesus comes back and he says, hey, sell everything you have and then come follow me. And it says the rich young ruler walked away sadly. And Jesus knew, man, he loves everything. He loves his possessions. He loves being called the rich young ruler. He loves his money more than he loves me. And if he's not willing to lose it all for me, then he can't follow me. If he can't surrender at all, he can't truly come after me. Think about this. Let me just say this. When it comes to to giving, when it comes to tithing, you know, just a few things. Start somewhere. 1%, 2%, 3%. You know, if you're not giving anything, just start somewhere and start giving to the Lord. He gave you everything you had anyways, by the way. Let me say this, if you feel like, man, I don't know what to do, I'm strapped financially, come by the office. Pastor Lane, our team, we'd love to work with you, we'd love to help you, we'd love to work it out on how you can give. And then, let me say a couple more things too. Sometimes we hold on to our giving because we're like, ah, I'm unhappy about this, I'm unhappy about that, I don't like what this person said or what this person did. Giving's between you and God. And so it's between you following or not following. And then lastly, let me give you a great prophetic word. I, you know, I hadn't heard this here. I've just heard it in the past. Well, I don't want to give because I don't know what the church is going to do with my money. All right, you ready to lean in? This is a prophetic word. Find another church. Find one that you can trust. If you don't trust giving the church your money, find one you can trust. And you know what often happens? You go to the next one, and a year later, you leave that one. And then a year later, you leave that one. Because it's really a problem with you and not the church now I know that gets us a little uncomfortable but my job's not always to make you comfortable I'd go be a motivational speaker and just pep you up all the time and say "Woo, let's go but what I want to do is speak the truth into your life and I and I've got to be accountable to God one day and, and, and I'm in the same boat listen I want things too but I want to see the things of God more than the possessions of this world and I want to follow what God has for my life more than I want to follow those worldly pleasures. Number three, let me give you this. Not only fully invested, but fully engaged. You know, when you think about this, man, she was fully engaged. All of her attention was captivated by Jesus. She was occupied by Jesus. Nothing else in that matter, in that moment mattered. Like she was occupied, full attention, full uh, fixated on Jesus. You know, you, you ever been somewhere where it's like you see something, but, you, but someone else doesn't really see it? You know, like that you can see something, but not really see it. Here's what I mean by that. My wife tells me all the time, you know, if we drive down the road, you can see a deer out of any field that you're looking. But if I tell you to grab something out of the pantry, you can't see nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look at there. He's heard that one. I was waiting for you, Mr. Rector. I knew that was coming. I mean, you know, sometimes it's right in front of us and we just miss it. We don't see it. Think about this. Everybody's worried about the perfume. They're worried about the value of the perfume instead of Jesus in that moment who's right in front of them. Now, let me give you this. Who is Mary of Bethany? You remember a guy named Lazarus? That Jesus said, Lazarus, get up out of the grave. And he raised Lazarus from the dead. That's her brother. 
And then I began to study and I began to read and I began to try to find, did this happen before? Did it happen after? You know, when did this happen? Well, look at John chapter 12 and look at verse 1 again. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the hometown of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, past tense. And then if you were to go back a couple chapters, or chapter before, or chapter 11, you'd see that moment where he raised Lazarus from the dead. Here's what I'm going to get at for a second. Mary of Bethany was there when Jesus said, Lazarus, get up from the grave. And because she saw the hand of God move, she never approached Jesus the same way. She never loved Jesus the same way. She never just came in the room with Jesus the same way again. In that one moment, everything changed for her. But guess who else was there? Judas. Who else would have seen that moment? Lazarus. Come out of that grave. And Lazarus comes out of that grave. And Judas saw it. Who was there when Jesus took a few loaves of bread and some fish and multiplied it to feed thousands? Judas. Who was there when Jesus made the blind see? Judas. Who was there when Jesus made the cripple walk? Judas. Who had a VIP pass and a backstage to every sermon Jesus preached? Judas. And yet he left. And he went back to the same things of life. Here's why this is so scary and convicting for all of us. Two people saw the same event. One never left the same way again, and one went right back to doing the same kind of stuff. It's convicting about the church in America, isn't it? That we could come in, we could see the presence of God moving, we could see God working, we could hear testimonies, we could see all kinds of stuff of God moving, and we could leave and go back to taking from the money bag to ultimately we'll betray him forever. And can I just tell you today, if you're coming and you're feeling God knocking on your heart, open the door. If you're feeling God prompting, step into faith and do it. If you feel God urging you, get into it. So you can be all around the presence of God and never step into it. Two people saw it, but only one person really saw it. Which one will you be? Will you be the one who sees it and leaves never the same way again? Or will you be the one who sees it and leaves and goes back to the exact same things? Sold out for Jesus or selling Jesus out? And number four, let me give you this today. You know, when you think about this woman, I got some guys who are going to bring a table up for me. We're going to end with a little illustration. But if you think about it, number four, fully poured out. You know, when I think about this woman, and I think about her pouring the, uh, the perfume out. It's a great picture of her pouring the perfume out. Uh, but also for me, I feel like it's just this beautiful picture of her not only pouring the perfume out, but literally just pouring her life out to Jesus in that moment. Like in that moment, she says, I don't care about the perfume. I don't care about the vase. I don't care what people think. I don't care what people say. I'm pouring everything out on Jesus. Every ounce of me, every part of me, I'm pouring it all out before Jesus Toby you're the man look at you now now I want everybody to recognize something here I've got some orange wine punch here and that's for a reason you better believe I wasn't about to buy any red Hawaiian punch right (laughs) hey listen this is all for Rocky Top right here somebody yelled out about roll tide last you know last service I said easy Judas you better watch out right (laughs) that's all I'm saying you gotta be careful with that but I just want to show you something real quick. I just want to illustrate it for us. You know, fully poured out. When we think about our lives, you know, let's just say this good old Hawaiian punch here. It, it kind of represents our life. And, and none of us would come right out and say, hey, I pour so much of my life into, into so much other things than Jesus, but I bet if we're honest, it might look at times a little different than we think. Like some of us, you know, uh, man, we spend so much time on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, and you spend time commenting and getting angry, and then every now and then somebody will comment back and ruin their witness, and then we're in this big storm, right? And, and, and then some of you, you know, you spend, let's just throw a bunch of things in here. You spend time on TV, and, and you spend time on your phone texting and scrolling, and so you just pour all this time and energy, you know, doing all these different things and scrolling up and down and getting angry and posting all kinds of stuff. 
And then when it comes to, you know, scrolling through the Word of God or spending time with Him, oftentimes we say, hey, Jesus, I just don't really have time. Let me just give you a little, a little drop. And then when it comes to our life with sports man I, I love sports let's just take this a lot of different ways sports hobbies music whatever it is whatever you love whatever you like to do man we spend so much time and energy investing into sports and we want to be on the best travel team and we want to travel all over the world and we want to spend all this money and then man we'll we'll change our schedule around all the time for sports and if it rains we'll go practice indoors if it rains at church we're staying home and watching tv like all these different things we're running around we're just pouring all this into it all this time and energy and we just pour all all over it all out into sports and we say hey Jesus you know we love you but uh, you know we're not going to miss these travel weekends of sports but we might miss church every now and again and so we'll just give you a little drop and then when it comes to friends I mean friends are great I love friends we hang out with friends all the time and we, we spend time we want to hang out with everybody you know pour ourselves out into relationships into friendships pouring ourselves out into friends and so we're just spending all kinds of time with friends doing all kinds of different activities whether it's the lake or different things and then when it comes to us you know being in a connect group or a d group we're like ah hey Jesus uh, iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another it doesn't really fit me quarter three strands easily broken that doesn't really fit me so I'll just give you a little drop And then when it comes to, you know, you know, our investments, we spend all this time and all this energy and all this money chasing the American dream and saying, I want the newest boat, I want the newest car, I want the newest house, so I'm going to pour everything I've got into all these different things, and I'm just going to pour it all out, all out, chasing after all these material possessions. And then, hey, Jesus, I might give you 1%, maybe 2 depends on how much I got left at the end of the month. I'll give you my leftovers. So we just give them a little drop and you know none of us none of us would come out and say hey this is our life and this is what we do but I bet if we tracked our life and really saw how much time how much energy how much time and attention we put pouring into so many different things as compared to Jesus it might look a little bit like this and I want to challenge you today man stop giving Jesus a drop whatever's causing you not to pour it out to Jesus break the vase break the jar and pour it all out to Jesus because I can tell you all these things are great but all these things will pass away and one day you'll stand before almighty God and either hear the words well done my good and faithful servant or depart from me for I never knew you and you won't be thinking about any of these things but only wish you, you poured more into Jesus and the things of Jesus and the kingdom because that goes on forever and ever and ever What is it the Apostle Paul says? I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. I'm already being poured out. And you know what the great thing about this is? When you begin to pour out into here, Jesus begins to pour into it too, and it just overflows. And then you can do all these things, and they'll overflow into these other categories, but you get him, and you receive him, the living water pouring out over into every area of your life with the right mindset, the right heart, and the first, what's truly first in life, in the right position, in the right spot. Let me ask you, are you sold out for Jesus? Or are you selling Jesus out? Are you Mary of Bethany? Or are you Judas Iscariot? The beautiful thing is, we all have a choice. Sold out or selling out? Mary or Judas? Judas?